Good afternoon and welcome to the latest Milwaukee Press Club virtual newsmaker. I'm your host, Milwaukee Press Club President Corey Hess from Wisconsin Public Radio. I have Claire Woodall Vogue as our guest. She'll be interviewed by a panel of three that will be coming up shortly. But first, I need to thank our sponsors. Presenting sponsor is Spectrum One News. Sustaining sponsor, Miller Koss. Our event partner is wispolitics.com. Wispolitics partners with, press, with the Press Club for this luncheon as part, as an, part of an ongoing series in Milwaukee, sponsored by UW-Milwaukee, Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at Pabst, Milwaukee Police Association, The Firm Consulting, Medical College of Wisconsin, and Spectrum. Once again, our guest today is Clara Woodall Vogue. Claire is the executive director of the Milwaukee Election Commission. She was appointed and confirmed in July by the Milwaukee Common Council, and I don't believe that she has slowed down for one minute since. Claire has worked for the Election Commission since 2013, except for a brief stint as Cedarburg's clerk. Claire, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself, Claire? Sure. So as you said, I've been with the Election Commission since 2013, um, and I think 2020 is something that no one could have predicted. Um, it's been a very unique time to be an election administrator. COVID-19 has definitely complicated elections in ways that I don't think anyone could have imagined. Um, it seems like every clerk has become both an election expert as well as a public health official. Uh, at the same time, we've seen a, while we've seen a thousand percent increase in mail-in voting, the amount of misinformation and skepticism at a national level around the validity of absentee voting has really taken off. Um, so it's become a daily priority for me to ensure that I'm communicating directly with the public through local media channels in order to provide accurate and real information as it relates to elections. So tomorrow, um, I'm very excited to announce that the city will launch our votes count in the 414 communications campaign. The campaign's focus not just on the fact that we are in a swing state and every vote counts, um, but also that we wanna ensure voters that voting will be safe and secure no matter which way they choose to vote this November. Um, and really wanna pull back that curtain and show all of the security precautions and really show voters all of the different steps we take to make sure that their vote will be counted on November 3rd, no matter their method of how they choose to vote. Um, so I'm honored to be here today and I look forward to the conversation about elections in the city of Milwaukee. Great, well, let's get started and meet our media panel. We have Allison Durr from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Kim Shine from CBS 58, and Laurel White from Wisconsin Public Radio. Allison, why don't you get us started? Okay. Um, thank you, Claire, for being here. Uh, I wanted to start with today's news about Miller Park and Pfizer Forum. Uh, I think uh, readers or, or um, viewers will remember that there was a late night meeting in June over um, early in-person voting sites. Um, I think in August, it was announced that Miller Park and Pfizer Forum would be uh, used as early in-person voting locations. And now today we hear that uh, this is not the case. I wondered if you could talk us through both, you know, what happened today, um, but then also, you know, what's kind of happened over the course of the last few months um, as we've seen these changes um, on, you know, in terms of the sites that the city will be using. Absolutely. So today, um, together with the mayor, we made a very difficult decision. Um, it we, we do feel as though we needed those additional sites to ensure that voters had safe um, and full access to early voting. Uh, we saw a dramatic drop in early voting at the Zeidler Municipal Building in August. Um, and we think it's in large part due to the 12 person capacity um, but going back a little bit, in June, we did have a late night meeting to approve our early voting locations. Um, this is the first time it's been done. It's a statute that has really come to light this year as all eyes are on Wisconsin. Um, but it was very difficult about four and a half months in advance to choose what 
election, what poll early voting locations would be suitable in the midst of a pandemic. We um, had not had health department officials go through buildings and determine capacity limits. And so I don't wanna say it was a, you know, a shot in the dark. We tried to establish locations that were geographically diverse um, and that would serve as many voters as possible. But at that point in time, um, Pfizer Forum and Miller Park or AmFam Stadium certainly weren't on the drawing board yet. Um, it was very important to me that that council meeting be held, even if it was at 11.30, um, to protect the city of Milwaukee voters and ensure that we were adhering to the very letter of the law. Um, so it was kind of my first act, even before becoming appointed, um, to really advocate for voters in the city of Milwaukee and make sure they have as many voting options as possible this fall. Again, we um, proceeded with those locations in August and saw that dramatic dip at Zeidler where we um, hoped that we would be justified in adding the two additional sites. In the spring, we did see that voters found drive-through voting a very popular option. Um, we were trying to find a location where we wouldn't create a two mile backlog in downtown Milwaukee and Miller Park seemed perfect for that. And then the Bucks offered us Pfizer Forum, which would be a great alternative to the municipal building um, because of its size and its state of the art um, ventilation system, extremely accessible. But so we passed that resolution on September 1st with our justification, but since that resolution, um, a district court judge, Judge Connolly, issued a ruling denying the plaintiff's request to extend the deadline to designate in-person absentee sites. And then the Wisconsin Election Commission yesterday um, really doubled down on his decision and said again that we could not add sites after the June deadline. So it was a very tough decision, but the last thing I would ever want is for city of Milwaukee voters to use either of those sites and then later have their ballots thrown out due to our mistake or our violation of a very unforgiving state statute. So it was a tough call and one that we're really disappointed to have to make, but we do think it's in the best interest for the city of Milwaukee voters. And just to follow up on that briefly, I mean, what, what is the impact of not being able to use these sites? So I don't think we'll know the impact um, until early, early voting really gets underway. Um, we are going to expand site the hours at the municipal building and do our best to um, make it as accessible as possible despite the capacity limits. And then we're also going to be talking to the three other sites that we currently don't have access to. They're not currently open to the public, um, but we're hoping to add additional sites by amending our notice because they were approved by the council in June. Thank you so much. I'll pass it off to Kim. Thank you, Claire, for being here this afternoon. Um, I also wanted to know just a little bit about the, the unprecedented amount of absentee ballots that you all are expecting this year. I'm wondering if you will have enough staff to count those and to report those results by election day, or do you think that, as you kind of said before, that these results might come after election day and, and when might they come? Yeah, so voters have until 8 p.m. to return their ballots on election day. Um, so we'll really be looking to the Wisconsin Election Commission for guidance on if we're able to release partial results on election night or whether we have to wait and make sure that every ballot that we've received by 8 p.m. is counted before releasing election results. Um, so we're looking to the WEC for some guidance. We are in really great shape for election workers at Central Count, which is where we process all of our absentee ballots. But, and as I've said this before, it's not always a people problem. Um, for us with counting absentee ballots, it's just a very precise, tedious process. Um, for every ballot that we receive on election day, it has to be sorted into one of 325 different voting wards. We then pick up from the last voter number, assign them a voter number and process their ballot by ward. Um, so it's not like when we receive incoming mail, we can just open it all and process it. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, and then we have to process it with its ward at the correct machine. Um, we have purchased additional tabulators though. So I'm confident that we will 
have election results, um, it might just be the very early hours of November 4th. Patrick, and just a quick follow up. Um, do you have enough poll workers at this point or are you still pushing it? And is there an ideal number that you need to make this process go as smoothly as possible? So our ideal number for polling places is 4,000. Our ideal number for central count would be about 350 workers per shift. Um, and we're in really good shape with both. So for e polling places, we already have 3,500 workers who have signed up for training or have already gone through training and are being assigned to work on election day. Our goal is to have 2,400 people show up um, so we are being very conservative in our estimates. We're estimating 20% of the people who've signed up for training won't show up, and then another 20% won't show up on election day. Um, we're seeing that COVID is really increasing quickly and people are becoming fearful again. So we're trying to work those contingency plans into our staffing numbers, um, and we're doing a really good job. Thanks, Laurel. I'll pass it off to you. Kim, and thanks again, Claire, for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about election observers. We know that the president is calling for his supporters to be election observers this year, to go to polling places and make sure things are going as they should be. Um, what sort of training, if any, are you providing to poll workers to, um, to sort of be prepared for a potential increase in election observers this year? Yeah, so with every presidential election, we see an increase in observers and we train our chief inspectors accordingly. The chief inspector is the person who's in charge of the polling place. That's who observers check in with. They are given an overview of the rules and shown the areas that is designated for observation. Um, and one important thing to note is that during COVID-19, some of our polling places, especially ones that have smaller spaces, will also be, have to limit the number of observers allowed at once. Um, so we're also training our chief inspectors on that. But with any election, um, I know there's lots of concerns about polling place safety and security and whether or not any observers could be there to intentionally um, kind of cause any interference or intimidation. So we continue to train our chief inspectors on what their role is to maintain control over the polling place and also ensure that no voter is experiencing any intimidation or badgering um, and that won't be tolerated. Um, so much so that if the observer isn't complying with the chief inspector, the next phone call is to the police who um, are more inclined to arrest um, and, and escalate a situation. So we're looking forward to a successful election with observer compliance. Um, I always am a big believer that you kind of create the environment that you wish to set. Um, but we are also working closely with law enforcement and monitoring any potential threats that could be posed on, on election day at polling places. Great, I'll hand it back to you, Allison. All right, thanks so much. Um, so in April, Milwaukee made national headlines for the um, five in-person polling locations, the long waits that some voters experienced during the pandemic. I'm, I'm wondering if you can lay out for voters, um, you know, how the November election is going to be different in Milwaukee uh, than, than April's. And I, I think in some ways how it might be similar with, um, you know, there's with um, the, uh, I guess, court battles that are still ongoing right before this election as well. Yeah. So one thing I can assure Milwaukee voters is that we will have 173 polling places open on election day. Um, it was really imperative to me coming into office that we take every effort, no matter how little sleep we've gotten over the past six months, to make sure that we keep voting at a neighborhood level. Um, so we've only had about seven polling place changes since the April election, well, since with since compared to the February election where we normally have 180 polling places. Um, so voters can look up their polling place on the My Vote website, it's completely up to date. And if a voter's polling place was changed, we have also sent them a postcard to notify them of that change. The biggest difference between April 7th and November 3rd is that we've had time to 
make all of the preparations necessary to ensure that everyone has a safe voting experience. You know, April 7th was really a picture of what a poll worker shortage looks like. And since then, we have had a huge number of younger um, professionals, students, um, even high school students apply to be poll workers so that we can ensure that even during a surge, um, we have poll workers who are comfortable and confident going into November 3rd, um, even if there is a risk to their health. And then voters should know that we are taking all of the health precautions possible. Um, so if you feel comfortable, I say it over and over again, but it really is similar. If you feel comfortable going to your grocery store, you should feel comfortable going to your polling place. We have plexiglass between election workers and voters. Uh, we observe social distancing. We will be constantly disinfecting all of the surfaces, including the voting booths between every voter. Um, and we're hoping that we won't see the congestion by keeping voting at a neighborhood-based level. It will be nothing like the lines that voters had to endure on April 7th. Very similar to April 7th, though, is that we are already in the midst of court litigation. Um, there has been an extension of the voter registration deadline. Right now, it is a postmark deadline to return your absentee ballot. So it just needs to be postmarked in the mail to us by November 3rd. Um, but we could see last minute changes. So it's more important than ever that voters really be monitoring what the current election law is all the way up, unfortunately, till election day. Um, we're hoping that these court cases have been brought in time for us to have final decisions well in advance of election day, but I'm not gonna hold my breath because because then inevitably it'll be um, at the last minute again. But I'm hopeful that we'll have final resolution and final answers about what the voting laws will be in Wisconsin um, and time to give voters notice and help them make their plan for voting. Um, and to follow up on that, you have asked that voters get their ballots in earlier as opposed to later. I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so as I explained earlier, um, that's really a selfish reason for us because it helps us with processing absentee ballots. The sooner a voter returns it, it instantly gets checked into our voter database, then sorted into one of 325 wards and then alphabetized. And it's one of the first ballots processed on election day. Where we usually have a delay and what causes us to have a delay often in election night results reporting is when we're receiving large volumes of absentee ballots throughout the day. Um, and we have to go through that entire process on election day and then integrate them into those 325 wards. So I'm encouraging voters if they already have their absentee ballot, don't delay and don't wait to the last minute to return it. But at the same time, um, voters certainly have that right, especially if they're on the fence, they don't know how they wanna vote, they aren't sure if they wanna go to their polling place yet. Um, I don't wanna discourage anyone from returning their absentee ballot at the last minute if that's what makes them comfortable. But the sooner that voters are returning their ballot, the sooner we'll have election results on election night. Thank you, and back to you, Kim. So, so far the uh, Wisconsin Election Commission has said that there's been about um, 36,000 absentee ballots returned. So just wondering how that process is going with making sure these ballots are okay and then um, reaching out to people to make sure that their ballot is processed appropriately. Yeah, so we had nearly 2,700 ballots in April that had to be rejected. Um, about 23 or 2,400 of them were because they lacked a voter signature or a witness signature. Um, so the city of Milwaukee wants to get that number way down. We like to see no ballots rejected. So we're being very proactive. Um, as we receive ballots, they are sorted into piles of completely valid, acceptable, and then ones that need the voter to make corrections, um, either missing a voter signature, a witness signature, or a witness address. If we're able to read the witness's signature and we can locate their voter registration record, we actually go ahead and write it in red and initial it um, as the clerks were able to do that. So that's the first step we do. We are turning those ballots around within 24 hours to voters, and we send them a letter letting them know what's missing from their ballot and how to correct the mistake. 
And then we've taken another action. We're being very proactive and working with common ground volunteers who are using a script that I've provided to call the voters and let them know so that they know to look out for their ballot in the mail um, and they know to open it immediately and also have answers in case they have questions about maybe they don't have a witness so we need to reissue a ballot or maybe they just have questions about the voting process, the volunteers are there to help answer their questions as well. So I think we're doing as much as possible, um, more than ever before, to really make sure that every voter's ballot will count on election day. Thank you. So the Republican Party of Wisconsin sent that letter last week about the possible presence of players or mascots at Miller Park or Pfizer Forum during voting events. Um, obviously, those sites aren't going to be used for early voting now, um, but do you anticipate that they will continue to be used for voter registration or other election related events? And if so, is, is that appropriate? Absolutely. So we are hoping that we can have absentee ballot drop off events at both sites, um, maybe do a voter registration drive before the close of voter registration. Um, and to think that having a mascot present in a nonpartisan way would be considered electioneering is quite frankly a little, a little ludicrous and certainly not um, what Wisconsin electioneering laws state. Um, and the Wisconsin election commissioner uh, administrator, Megan Wolf was in agreement. And I know she made a statement that, that that's not what electioneering is. Um, any, anyone can appear and have a nonpartisan message. Um, it's important to us, especially at polling places, that any type of event that could pose any distraction from voting still be 100 feet or more away from the polling place. Um, but to think that Bango has political views and is telling someone how to vote um, is a little ludicrous and a little dramatic, in my opinion. But um, we are hoping to have some drop-off events and we'll be announcing those as we finalize them. Great, thank you. Back to you, Allison. Um, Claire, I wondered if you could expand a little bit on the COVID-19 precautions, um, including whether or how the health department might be involved um, and how they've been involved in this process, um, you know, to, I guess, find the sites and, um, you know, and, and what they've been uh, helping with so far in terms of like setting them up and preparing for both, um, you know, both election day and um, the uh, central count location. Yeah, so the health department has been really integral as we were creating our election day plans um, and creating our training for election inspectors and chief inspectors. So um, while it is not required and not being provided by the state election commission, for instance, all of our poll workers will be offered a face shield just for additional protection on election day. Um, so voters can expect to see all of their election workers will have masks on. Many of them, um, if not all of them, will also have face shields. Anyone operating out in front of the plexiglass shields will have face shields on. Um, many of our election workers will also choose to wear gloves. Um, it's not recommended or required by the CDC, but because they aren't able to constantly be going and washing their hands, it's much easier to change a pair of gloves or to re-sanitize um, a pair of gloves throughout the day. And then um, all voters are asked to wear a mask as well. Under the state mandate, it is certainly um, encouraged. And in order to vote inside the polling place, the city of Milwaukee asks voters to wear a mask if they are able to do so and don't have a medical exemption. And then we are very lucky at Central Count, um, the health department and the um, DCD helped us find a vacant office building downtown. Um, it's at 501 West Michigan Street, and it really doesn't do justice until you walk into the building, but we are taking up an entire floor, which is truly the length of an entire city block in order to set up and process absentee ballots. And what it allows us to do is to not have to limit the number of election inspectors. So we can have 350 election inspectors in the room all at once. 
because social distancing is still possible. It's that large and wide open and expansive. Um, so it really will help ensure that our central account workers feel safe um, and that they can still practice all of the health and safety guidelines while processing between 150 and 200,000 ballots. Kim, back to you. Thanks. So, so some states, uh, like Georgia and Minnesota, they allow for the processing of mail-in ballots as soon as they're received. But here, obviously, it's on election day. So I was wondering, kind of looking ahead towards the future, since this has been just a crazy year, just in general, um, for elections, do you think that there could be or that there should be any changes to when absentee ballots are counted here in Wisconsin? You know, there definitely should be. And the city of Milwaukee has advocated for years for this. Um, and it's been really disappointing that our state legislature has not come back into session and taken any action on this. There is a bill um, that passed the House earlier this spring, but the state Senate did not take it up that would allow us to start processing the day before the election. Um, what this would enable is for us to have more workers. A lot of our um, poll workers have offered that if they were to pass legislation that they would be willing to come the day before and help us process. But it also ensures that we aren't rushed. When we are um, under the gun, everyone's waiting for our election results after 8 p.m. There is this sense of urgency um, that's really unfair to our election workers who are really committed to preserving the integrity and the accuracy of our central count results. Um, and even in Michigan, they, they passed a law allowing um, election officials to go ahead and begin counting and they said the caveat was it's just for this election. Um, that would be a common sense measure that our state legislature could take that would allow us to test it out. Um, in April, we didn't have any election results for an entire week after the election. And I'm not aware of any election clerk leaking those or compromising those results in any way. Um, so the reasons against allowing us to account ahead of time are really weak in my opinion. Um, and could really alleviate the burden that election administrators in Wisconsin are faced with. Um, the bill in the spring received bipartisan support. It's supported by clerks all over the state. And to me, it's just common sense. Why not ensure that we do have election results as soon after 8 p.m. as possible and really alleviate any fear or anxiety with the public and any misunderstanding um, about where suddenly votes come from at 3 a.m when I, as an election official, know exactly where those votes came from. They came from all of our absentee ballots that have to be reported all at once um, and, and complete uh, under Wisconsin election law. Thanks, and just a quick follow-up to that. Do you think the opposition for you know, counting a, ahead of time is more so just because one side or the other just wants to win uh, because the voters matter here and that's what everyone has been saying. But when it comes to actually making that a priority, there seems to be roadblocks like this one possibly. You know, this issue quite frankly, just as maybe I'm too close to it, but as an election administrator, it makes no sense because we're going to have a winner either way. It's just whether you want to know those results at eight o'clock or do you want to wait until 3.30 a.m. Um, when the news cameras are chasing in 2018, following Neil onto the elevator. Um, I think that it would provide more transparency and a lot less confusion to voters, especially voters who were in cities where we use a central count um, processing site because there was accusations in the 2018 election of voters went to sleep and it shows that all of the polling places have reported, but there's a lot of misunderstanding that doesn't include our absentee numbers. So then there were accusations about where did those 40,000 ballots come, even from Governor Walker at the time, um, which is not fair because they were there all day and being counted all day. It's just a tedious process that takes time. So I don't really, honestly, I don't know of any other reason other than a desire to continue public confusion over election results. Um, which is a really major concern for election officials going into this election. Thank you. And Laurel, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. So I wanted to ask two kind of clarifying process questions for people because I know that they will be watching closely on election night. 
Um, one's a direct follow-up on what you were just talking about with Kim, which is um, when you see the percentage reporting for Milwaukee, um, that percentage does not include absentee ballots. So it could say 100% reporting, but that doesn't include those absentee numbers, right? Correct. So absentee numbers are brought in all at once. Um, and even though the county software will say that we have 100% of precincts reporting at 9 p.m., for example, if we have not imported the central count absentee numbers, um, it doesn't include those. And so it's really not until the county announces that all absentee ballots have also been counted that they're official. And then to follow up on that, I think people have an understanding of you know, it takes a while to count mail-in ballots and that's different than someone just going on election day and putting it in the machine. Can you walk through the process of what processing an absentee ballot looks like? What are the clerks doing um, or the workers doing behind the scenes to get those ballots, um, you know, counted? Yeah, so I'm really looking forward. We're having an open house at our warehouse tomorrow for media for this purpose is kind of to illustrate these processes. Um, so the first thing, anytime we receive a ballot, whether it's two weeks before election day or on election day, the ballot gets checked into the list vote database, which is our statewide voter database and voters would see on my vote that we received their ballot. It then gets put into a specific voting ward and the city of Milwaukee has 325 and then it gets alphabetized within that ward. On election day, all of our election inspectors, um, they work in pairs and they review the certificate envelopes to make sure it has a voter signature, a witness signature, and a witness address, and then the envelopes are opened. One um, of the election workers will call out the voter's name on the envelope, and then the other one will announce the voter number. The voter number gets written on the absentee certificate envelope, and then also in an absentee ballot log, much like a poll book um, that's at a polling place, so that every voter gets a voter number. If a voter's ballot was damaged and we're worried it cannot go through the machine or our military and overseas voters are able to have their ballot emailed to us, they print it out and mail it back, those ballots get reconstructed. Um, so you hear about reconstructing ballots. It's if something happened um, in the on its way to us in the mail, um, or if their ballot was originally emailed to them, then the election workers work in a pair to reconstruct their ballot onto an official ballot um, and voting exactly how the voter voted. And there's paperwork to complete anytime you're reconstructing a ballot as well. Once all of the envelopes are opened for award, the ballots are then flattened. Um, as silly as it sounds, allowing us to open ballots before election day would help with a major issue which is that ballots are folded um, and it's harder to go through a high-speed tabulator when you have those folds. So we work to get them as flat as possible. Um, and then the stack of ballots is brought up to the tabulating machine. Um, our tabulators uh, will put the ballots through the machine. They compare the last voter number to the number of ballots counted in the machine to make sure there weren't any discrepancies, make sure a voter number wasn't skipped or issued twice um, and is that detailed and then they get bagged into a secure ballot bag um, and then put aside until we receive more ballots on election day for that ward. Great, thank you so much. Allison? Great, thank you. Um, Claire, I wondered if, I know you're having the event tomorrow, um, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about election security. Um, both with the absentee ballot boxes that the city has installed, um, I think 15 across the city, and, um, you know, kind of the, the security of the voting machines, um, if you could, you know, kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, so our drop boxes are more secure than your average U.S. Postal Service blue um, mailbox. They are under 24-hour video surveillance. We have adhered seals to them so that we can see if anyone um, somehow was able to open the box and remove any ballots or was tampering with it, those seals would be broken and we have evidence of that. So those are inspected every time our teams of two go out to collect the ballots. So it's always two people um, and then they carefully record seal numbers. 
they have a chain of custody for the ballots that they are putting in ballot bags. And then they're checked back in at our election warehouse, uh, which is also under 24 hour video surveillance. It is actually um, double locked. So our doors are locked, but then the ballots are stored in another locked room within the facility that's under 24 hour video surveillance. For election security, especially for the voting machines, voters should know that our uh, machines are programmed entirely offline. And then we test every machine. We have a test deck of ballots that we feed through the machine and then we modem the results in order to make sure that the machine is casting the votes as accurately as it should um, so that there wasn't any programming error and to make sure that if you vote for John Smith, John Smith is getting the vote. Or if you are writing in someone, the write-in is getting the vote. So that every single machine in the city of Milwaukee is tested ahead of election day. We have a printout of that to certify that we tested the machine. And then the machines are offline. So there's no way to actually hack into the machines once we've loaded the election onto them. So they're offline on election day. Okay. Um, Kim, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks. So I was also wondering, I know that Wisconsin um, does not collect race data for registered voters, but I was wondering here in Milwaukee, if you have all have done anything specifically to, um, to encourage uh, registration for black and brown voters, uh, because historically, you know, there have been suppression efforts to these communities directly. So um, we were very lucky to receive a grant that's allowed us to hire a marketing and communications firm for this fall, um, which is focusing on um, partly on those efforts. We've seen in, especially in 2016, a drop in voter registration and a drop in participation, um, especially in Aldermanic District 15 and District 6. Um, so it's been really important to me that we make sure that our education campaign and that get out the vote campaigns are um, accessible in those communities and that we are looking at all different formats, whether it be radio, digital, billboards, um, to make sure that community members, if they want to vote, they know how to vote. Um, and then we're really working on increasing education around the photo ID law. In 2016, when it went into effect, there really wasn't much education, especially within communities like the city of Milwaukee, um, to educate voters on the meaning of the photo ID law. And one of the biggest um, pieces of misinformation and confusion that we see is a lot of voters think that their ID has to have their current address. And we'll never capture the number of voters that don't even go to the polling place because they don't think they have the ID that they need to vote. Um, so we're working with our communications firm to really emphasize the messaging that your ID does not need to have your current address. You can bring, if you need to update your address, another proof of address document, um, but to make sure that that new, still relatively new photo ID law isn't discouraging anyone from going and voting on election day. Um, and then lastly, we're really working to make sure that all of our communications are both in English and Spanish. Um, all of our absentee instructions, regardless of where you live, were sent out in English and Spanish for this election because we didn't want to. We to, under, under federal law, we have to target certain communities where we know based on our voter registration data, there's more Hispanic voters registered to vote. But it was important to me that we not be making any assumptions and missing any voters who might be, have English as a second language. Um, so we've really increased that and are also increasing our amount of communications that will be in Spanish as well. Thanks. Go ahead, Lowell. Thank you. So uh, what have you seen from voter registration um, this summer and fall? Uh, are the numbers consistent with what you've seen in previous years or any decline because of COVID? No, so we've actually seen an increase in registered voters over the past month, especially. Um, the state of Wisconsin sent out a mailing to all registered voters with an absentee application, but it was important to us to complement that mailing. So we sent out a postcard 
Um, it was our safe boat postcard to all households in the city of Milwaukee, um, encouraging them to update their registration and apply for an absentee ballot, and then offering assistance if they needed it at any Milwaukee Public Library for six weeks, five days a week for six hours a day. Um, and I can't attribute all of our registration numbers to that postcard, but since sending it out, um, we've had over 10,000 new voters register in the city of Milwaukee um, just over the past month. And that doesn't take into consideration address changes where they were already active and registered but completed a new registration. Um, that's just in addition to the number of registered voters, which is really phenomenal in my opinion. Um, it does show that our, our message is getting out to voters and that voters are finding, especially the My Vote website, really easy to use and really easy to navigate. Um, the state has made lots of improvements to the My Vote website over the past year. And I think it's really paid off over the past six weeks. So that 10,000 number that you've seen over the past month or so, that's more than we saw, for example, in 2016? Yes, I don't know the exact number right offhand, um, but I'm actually very confident that our, our number of registered voters right now um, is right around what it was in 2016 before we had a drop off in the voter registration rolls. Um, we have about 311,000 registered voters right now. Um, and after 2016, we got down as low as 270,000. Great, thank you. I'll send it over to Allison. There, there have been reports that the Justice Department and FBI are planning for this uh, possibility of election day violence and voting disruptions. Um, I know Washington Post had a story on this, uh, I believe today or, or very recently. Um, is, is that something you've heard anything about locally? Um, and are there any preparations taking place in case either of those, um, either of those two things come to pass? Yeah, so voters should know we, especially before every general election, we have very open channels of communication with law enforcement and intelligence um, agencies in preparation for election day. And this year is no different. Um, it's unique in that you, in most years, our biggest threat are cybersecurity attacks. And this year we are facing more concerns around actual poll in place um, safety concerns. But as of right now, we're not aware of any imminent threat. Um, and again, we will be training our chief inspectors, our election inspectors, and our law enforcement officers across the city of Milwaukee on what is and is not allowed at a polling place. I mean, are you aware of any cybersecurity threats this year? Um, so yes and no, there's always cybersecurity threats. Um, the biggest one is actually that I've heard is not necessarily against our infrastructure, but really the cybersecurity concerns of people um, posing outsiders, foreign influences, creating misinformation, especially the most recent threat has been a concern about them creating misinformation about election results on election day using different social media channels. Um, but we continue to work really closely with the Wisconsin Election Commission. They have created over the past four years, lots of different security protocols from the software that we install in our computers to using multi-factor authentication in order to log into our voter database, um, which has really been reassuring that there haven't been any successful attacks, especially on the voter registration database. I mean, Kim, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, I wanted to take it back to before you were appointed for this position. I know that there was some back and forth between council members about whether or not you were properly vetted for this and whatnot. So at this point, I just kind of wanted to know um, why you chose to withdraw yourself then and obviously you came back and then how do you think you're doing now? Yeah, so I think um, to, I, for me, it was an insinuation that the election commission hasn't considered equity and inclusion. Um, I went through a Judd Legg hearing where my um, nomination was reviewed and committee members had an opportunity to ask questions. And then it was at my confirmation before the common council that they proposed that you send all, all um, 
of the cabinet members back to committee. And I was looking at having an election six weeks in advance um, and really feeling a lot of pressure. I have worked tirelessly since February 1st, since returning to the city um, to make sure that we have equity and inclusion, especially for voters of color in the city of Milwaukee. Um, and you know, I was the only incoming department head. Everyone else was already in charge of their departments. So I felt really limited by that decision. Um, and there was no special hearing for me to move it up and make it faster. Um, so it was definitely, you know, I will say this has not been an easy year for election officials. Um, we put our entire lives on hold um, and our families have suffered. And, you know, usually that's the month or two before an election. It's not an eight month marathon, um, which this year has been. So I am happy I reconsidered. Um, I do think that my commitment to the city of Milwaukee has been illustrated. Um, we opened 168 polling places in August and had plenty of poll workers for the August election. Um, and I'm really committed, but it felt quite frankly like a, a punch to the gut after giving my everything to the city for the, the four months before that decision in June. Thank you, go ahead, Laura. Thank you. So I wanted to walk through a specific scenario um, with you. So obviously there's um, some concern about voters getting their mail-in ballots back on time. Um, you know, I know you're encouraging people to send them as soon as they get them and as soon as they're able, you know, getting them back early. What if someone um, mails their ballot back, but they haven't um, been able to confirm that the clerk has received it? Um, by election day, are they able to go in on election day and cast a ballot in person? Can you kind of um, tell us what that voter should do in that situation? Yeah, that's a really good question because it is not common sense. Um, if you have mailed your ballot back to us, you are not able to go vote on election day, um, even if we have not received it, which is really unfortunate. Um, and I think a very poorly written law um, but as of right now, if you return your ballot, you need to make sure um, that you do not go vote on election day. And I know at one point the president was encouraging voters in North Carolina, hey, return your ballot and then go vote at your polling place, which would be a felony in Wisconsin. So um, if you are returning your ballot within a week before the election, that's when if you live in the city of Milwaukee, I'd really encourage voters to use a drop box so that they know we receive it. There's no question about it and they feel confident going into election day that they have already voted. Um, but if you put it in the mail, you cannot say, oh, well, the election commission hasn't received it. I'll just go vote on election day. Um, it is against the law in Wisconsin. Thank you to our journalist panel. And thank you, Claire. I just want to interrupt. I'm sorry to do so. This has been great. But we do have some questions from the audience that I want to get in before this ends. And I did promise to let everyone be done by one o'clock. <laughs> so um, one of our first questions is, do you plan to ask Governor Evers to call in members of the National Guard to ensure there will be enough poll workers? So at this point, we don't plan to. We think that when we get to our staffing number of 4,000 workers, we will have accounted for 20% not showing up to training and 20% not showing up on election day. And we'll still have two to 300 workers on our reserve list to respond to election day no shows. So at this point, we're very confident the community has really stepped forward and we don't see a need to call on Governor Evers to send in the National Guard, at least here in the city of Milwaukee. At what point would you have to make that choice? So we would make that choice. Um, well, it'd really be Governor Evers' choice, but we will continue to assess um, our training attendants and then assigning voters uh, or poll workers to their locations. But uh, we usually have a good idea of what election day will look like with staffing um, by the week before the election. Are you communicating with the Postal Service so that any issues regarding delivery of absentee ballots can be resolved quickly? Yes. So I'm very happy to report that with the city of Milwaukee, we have very open communication with the post office. Um, we eliminated our third party mailer 
over the summer. So all ballots um, are sent directly. They're taken by our staff directly from our warehouse to the Postal Service, put into the mail stream. Um, and we have had great responses from the Postal Service anytime that we have a particular ballot, for instance, that maybe says it's been out for delivery for two or three days and having the Postal Service look into it. Um, and that's in great part due to the state's transition to having intelligent mail barcodes where we're able to give the post office more information um, in order for them to give us more information about what might have happened to a ballot. And then we're in constant communication with them about the current court decision being a postmark deadline and ensuring that ballots receive a postmark on election day and in the weeks up to election day in case that um, is in fact the law when we go into November 3rd. Okay. Um, let's see, wondering about how the handling is being done of the issue of the ballot sent out without the clerk's initials. Yeah, so I'm really happy to report that was a very um, isolated, it was not a widespread issue, but when you're dealing with quantities of tens of thousands of ballots, um, what happened is sometimes ballots stick together just like pieces of paper and some of them did not get the clerk's initials. Uh, we've encouraged voters if they think that they might not have had my initials on their ballot, or if they know we're happy to reissue the ballot as a safeguard. But under Wisconsin um, election day law and guidance, it wouldn't be a reason to reject a ballot just because it lacked clerk's initials on election day. Um, but it seems like it was a very isolated, it wasn't tied to a batch or a whole group of ballots. Um, but was a very random error due simply to the fact that the ballots stuck together. Okay, and someone wants to know after the announcement today about the Pfizer Forum in Miller Park, is there any chance that that could be changed and it would be open for voting on November 3rd? So no, Miller Park and Pfizer were never intended to be election day polling places. Um, it's very important to us that election day polling places remain at a neighborhood based level. Um, but we, I don't see them reopening as early voting sites as either. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking every precaution to make sure that every voter's ballot will be counted. And it just seems like a very judicious and cautious decision that we have to make in light of the current court ruling and WEC guidance. All right. Well, thank you again, Claire, for your time. I again want to thank our sponsors, Spectrum One News, Miller Koss, and thank you to our event partner, wispolitics.com, and um, the sponsors, UW-Milwaukee, Wisconsin Academy for Global Education tra and Training, 1125 at the PAPS, Milwaukee Police Association, the firm Consulting, Medical College of Wisconsin, and Spectrum. And if you liked what you saw today, please consider donating to the Milwaukee Press Club's endowment. You can do so by going to milwaukeepressclub.org and clicking on MPC Endowment. We do have some upcoming events. Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett will be joining us on October 28th. And Charles Franklin from Marquette, the guy who does all the polling and surveys, will be here on November 11th. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for our journalist panel. And thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you.